Uh, one of the very, I think, classic algorithm for Go conditional reinforcement learning called the hindsight experience replay. And afterwards, I will be talking about how we can adapt this uh, algorithm to um, to our language models and see how it performs actually on some of the big bench tasks. Let's uh, start it. Yeah. So this is a paper called the Wisdom of Hindsight makes language models better instruction followers. Uh, we submitted this paper to ICML this year, and uh, this is joint work with me, uh, Function, and also uh, Peter and Joey, my advisor. And uh, so, so currently, um, I think we are probably also familiar with the Flan series of work. This work uh, consists of like Flan V1 and Flan V2 work. So the current uh, the Flan work is basically called just the instruction tuning. We have the this uh, example is common sense reasoning. We have the inputs, we have the targets, and then we do this uh, different task trying to do the supervised learning. And uh, then comes the Flan V2 paper. Uh, their, their paper is mainly talking about how we can scaling up the multitask instruction fine tuning. So what they choose is like they choose 1,800 tasks, and then they do this joint uh, multitask fine tuning instruction fine tuning. And uh, more interestingly, they, they, they uh, find out that uh, it not only gener generalize to a task that is uh, pretty find in your training data set. Like, uh, for example, it's a chain of thought uh, fine tuning, consists of uh, answer the following questions step by step. The cafeteria has 23 apples. They have used 20, for them, uh, 20 of them for lunch and then bought six more. How many apples like uh, do they have uh, right now? And then this is like from the training data set, but you could also develop a different questions based on this format, like uh, we have uh, maybe 20 pairs, and then they use like 10 pairs for lunch. They bought like 10 more, and then how much pairs do you have right now? This is like different tasks you haven't seen in the training data set. The model not only can generalize to this type of the new um, question in the same task, but it also can generalize to different tasks. For example, the question here is what this is also the figure they use in the paper is like uh, the new question is uh, can George uh, can Jeffrey Hinton have a conversation with George Washington? So give the relation before answering, and uh, the the model would be answering like Jeffrey Hinton is a British Canadian computer scientist, but he's born in nineteen forty seven, and George Washington was died in like uh, seventeen ninety nine. So they cannot have a conversation together and the, the answer is no. And uh, they show that by massive training of the different, uh, like 1,800 tasks, the model can also generalize to a new type of tasks with uh, just a zero shot capability. So here is how they're measuring their, um, their scores. We can see that uh, they test like a two series of the of some base models. One is the T5 series. And uh, after the instruction fine tuning, they call the FLAN T5. Uh, we can see that the average score of the FLAN T5 is from like uh, even the 80 million models to I think 11 billion models. They have a massive improvement. And uh, for the FLAN Palm series of the models, we can see that uh, they also have uh, different levels of improvement, even with uh, 500 uh, and the 40 billion models, which is called a flan T5. So this shows like uh, um, this massive instruction following or this uh, post-training to do the model alignment with uh, human instructions. Uh, this still like uh, is, uh, is, is not only good only with uh, only pre-trained model, you have to do some of post-training, post-pre-training processing, or post-processing, uh, sorry, post-pre-training, another level of fine-tuning to get uh, the satisfactory level of this, uh, of this experience, this performance. So what can we say about this, uh, this type of flame fine-tuning, right? And uh, the first one is like, uh, this, this data is very, very hard to get especially like for some of the academia people. Uh, this first thing is like, we need a huge amount of human annotated data. And this type of data is not uh, so easy. Like for example, they have 
been trying to use 1,800 tasks. And on average, maybe each of the tasks is um, 1,000 data. So this will come to a lot of uh, a thousand or more data. So this will come to, um, I think, a lot of more data they have been using. And uh, the second one is like, uh, this is unlike the previous vision, like data collection. A vision collection is only you need to, you know, looking at the picture, for example, for clarification task, you're looking at the picture and then you ask a human what's inside the picture. Is this a cat or this is a dog or something? This is relatively easy to get the labels. But here you would say like, uh, in order to have uh, collect this data set, you need to have good instructions. Like uh, you have to have a good format in order to generalize. Like for example, in here, you may write the instructions like answer the questions uh, by reasoning step by step, or you have to actually provide a good format. So for example, some of the chain of thought in context examples you provided to the language model to actually um, keep the language model's uh, capability of following this uh, example instructions. But the third one also is like pretty important is like sometimes you not only need to provide the answer, you also need to provide some explanations in your labels. So this would mean that uh, in, when you write this type, like let's also see this uh, flan series of uh, task collection as an example. This not, not this also means like uh, uh, in your task answer you could write something like uh, minus three hundred twenty point four Celsius or you can or you need to write something like the entire reading pass like the cafeteria had twenty three apples originally and then they have step by step reasoning and finally they reach an answer. This all need to be collected by the human laborers. So this is something we also kind of uh, want to get avoid when you're when you're doing this uh, data set collection, not only because this is uh, expensive for uh, some of the academic academic people, but also I think it's not so scalable. And uh, this uh, won't be generating even bigger, like it won't be generating the, the data set in the maybe billions level of these data points. And now afterwards, they introduced another, uh, the OpenAI introduced another uh, RHF framework. So based on this uh, supervised fine tuning, based on this uh, uh, instruction tuning, we could actually use reinforcement to directly optimize the language model with human feedback. So the entire pipeline is they have this pre trained language model, the gathering data, they train a reward model, and then they fine tune this uh, language model with RL. Let's take a look at each of the step. Uh, I'll just recap very quickly on this one. So this first step is you do the data set gathering. This basically means you have a prompts data sets, and then you sample many prompts to feed them to the initial language models. And you ask the language model to output, uh, like say 10 or 100 of the outputs. And afterwards you ask a human uh, to scoring or to rank which of the outputs they really like very much. So uh, afterwards, they could train a reward model to predict the score or predict the relative ranking between each of these outputs. And uh, after this the first step, the next step is a very common uh, or like uh, RL training of the, of the initial language model with the help of this reward model. So basically they use this reward model as a reward function in our environment. This is because like uh, we don't have a perfect uh, reward function to align for human score, for human preferences. So we need to learn that from data as well. And uh, the whole pipeline is also kind of relatively, sim uh, relatively simple. It's like just a PPO uh, training. We feel training with a reward function generated by the reward model. And they introduce another additional care constraint, which basically says your uh, trained, your tuned language model after the P PPO fine tuning should be relatively close to your base model, which is only the initial language model you're providing. This basically says in in that in your new like language model, 
this should be staying relatively close to your base model as well. And they incur a large care penalty, care prediction shift penalty, if they are pretty much very far away from each other. They, they just said this is uh, not good. So here's also a, here's just a um, summarization of all the all the steps. Like you use a triple algorithm, you perform reward modeling, and then you add the key regularization to guarantee the fine tuning model is close, and uh, you could you know rank the outputs. And uh, now I just want to show that how important this step is, so that we can see basically original GPT-3 series, the definition series, and uh, it's uh, only pre-trained. And afterwards they do the instruction tuning, we could get something around code definition uh, 002. And then you, like you do the supervised instruction tuning, it gets text definition 002, right? But afterwards you do the RHF, and then you get this newer models, text definition 003 and chat GPT. So these two models, comparing these two models and previous the non rh fine-tuned models of the text definition 002, we could see like actually we, we experienced a pretty much benefit from this uh, RH fine-tune. There are actually a couple of points I want to highlight. So this highlights also brought, brought from uh, another UCR PhD's uh, blog post. And uh, this would say like, uh, you know, there's, there's major improvement by RHF. The first one is like uh, the responses are more informative. So if you're comparing text of there is a switch generation, it's usually longer. And the uh, chat GPT's uh, response is even more uh, verbose than one could explicitly ask. Um, and then the second one is like, uh, it has like uh, impartial answers. So for example, ChatGPT also gives very balanced responses on the events involving like uh, interest from multiple entities. So especially like if people do not have an agreement on what's, uh, what's, uh, what's, what is a good response, people might have different opinions. So the ChatGPT or this RLH uh, fine tuning pipeline will be giving you more uh, information on how people would uh, think, like basically tells you this, tells the language model this type of the questions is uh, people don't have agreement on. Like uh, then you could generate as much diverse as possible these uh, questions. This, sorry, this answers to the questions. And so on, it's like uh, it learns to rejecting the improper questions. For example, the question is like uh, um, outside the model's capability, and uh, this also combines with the second point he listing here is rejecting questions outside the knowledge scope. We can often see that, uh, for example, the events after the June 2021, uh, the model would be rejecting or the model would specifically tells you this is not something I have learned before. If you want me to answer the questions, probably you, know, you need to combine some of the retrieval based method. Now this is the exciting part I want to share. What the the thing I've seen, seeing why this pipeline is a little bit uh, complex or um, have some basic basic limitations, and then we can try to improve based on these limitations. And this also inspires our our work on two ISML. So the first one is like um, I think the current RHF uses just a one step ranking. They use the reward model. There's, I think, a large set of the limitations here because human cannot easily rank the partial answers. Um, but uh, again, I think this is uh, for uh, RL people. It's not super, super efficient. Like we have seen enough evidence from the last maybe five or 10 years. Let's see, like um, if you could provide, if you have some way to provide a dense reward rather than a sparse reward, the our algorithm's performance will be dramatically improved. So this is one thing we could uh, be also trying to utilize for this large language models as well. Because uh, right now, if you only use one step ranking, like generating the entire response and use the reward model to give the score of this one, it is more or less like a banded algorithm. So 
this doesn't fully utilize the MDP structure of RL. And uh, plus, like uh, we think that, uh, at least I'm thinking this a uh, sparse reward putting at the very end could be not as informative as enough if comparing to if we are having some ways to provide uh, this reward modeling to the intermediate steps. So to, to these two points, like uh, I, I do think uh, if we can have some ways to do the dense reward, uh, especially providing either partial feedback or providing feedbacks for the intermediate steps. This will be fully utilized the potential of RL and uh, fully utilize the MTP structure. But in this case, also it's a partial of the for MTP. And second one is uh, a little bit more myself, like the speculation, but I haven't got time to actually verify this. Uh, but this is originally, this originate from the offline RL setting which is we think that uh, maybe training a reward model on relatively small scale data set can get some out, out of distribution errors. This is uh, basically the entire, this is basically the entire, I think, uh, field of study in the offline RL. And uh, given a data set, how could you try to avoid this out of distribution errors and get, um, get a good policy out of this data set? This again, this might be avoided by a lot of the um, natures in this of uh, in these large language models. For example, you do the tokenization because uh, then you don't have a continuous space. You have a combinatorial large, I think, discrete space. But this is some of the also hypothesis from my mind that uh, this could be could be happening if we have uh, if we if we the data set we collect is relatively small. And uh, also, there's one other evidence from the open eyes uh, algorithm is like they also add this additional care constraint. So um, this could possibly mean this care constraint term is much uh, more or less similar to what we have in the behavior constraint or the policy constraint for the offline settings. Basically, you have your new policy has to be close together to your collected data set, this type of constraint. So this would again, I think, encourage a little bit of intuition on uh, this might be a problem in the large language model as well. This uh, out of diffusion, out of diffusion errors. And third one is like the data gathering is really, really also expensive because uh, I'm we're still not sure how large the data set size using the open AI's uh, uh, schema. They claim in their original paper is not too much. It's about uh, several, I think uh, at most 100K or something. But uh, I do suspect like out of the, out of the, all the data collected afterwards, they actually use a very large data set and training a reward model to do this. And this is not so, this is, this process is not, not as much, um, is one is expensive. And another one is like some of the, tasks which human cannot easily rank which one is better uh, so you might be arguing that if the human cannot be easily ranking the two outputs are kind of equally good but there's do have some of the tasks which would spend human also a lot of time like maybe do some of the reading summarizations or maybe you could do some of the i think solving a great level great school level or a college level um, mathematical questions, human would also be it would also need to take a lot of time reading the outputs of the language models, especially on the especially on the I think uh, college level mathematical questions. You have to check if every step is uh, makes sense, like if they did some calculation wrong, or if every step is um, you know consistent with the previous. If I put assumption in the very previous. If the second step doesn't break this assumption, or it actually follows this uh, follows this assumption and do some further, um, I think derivation. So this this type of the data would be also requiring a lot of the human analytics effort to do this. So this part is again also um, the expensive or the the inefficiency of the data gathering. But we haven't actually honestly. Speaking, we have not able to address this part in the current paper. We're actually also working on this now. And uh, we have a couple of uh, 
I think also pretty very interesting ideas on it, how we can resolve this part. So now I think hopefully everyone gets a, a gets a sense of how the current status of the RHF now, and then I'll be introducing a little bit about this uh, one of the very classic R algorithms called hindsight experience replay, and uh, this is a very common algorithm used or very popular algorithm used in co conditioned R, and uh, the reason why is uh, why we I want to introduce this is this I think is very natural fitting for our for our um, large language models with instruction fine tuning or with uh, instruction alignment. Basically the alignment of problem of these language models could be casting very naturally to this framework. So what does this framework tell you about us? Uh, tell us about uh, the, the framework. It's like uh, a major motivation backing, like I think uh, this is also published in, in 1718 ish or even earlier, I guess. But uh, a major problem back then is like uh, the very, com a co very common challenge in the RL is the reward modeling. And uh, for example, like if we want to do robotics R manipulation task, uh, one need to have pretty much very good expertise in designing this reward. Like we often need a reward on the distance between the distance of this robot whisper robot and also the actual object you want to manipulate. And after the robot whisper, uh, uh, gripper successfully touches the object, you would also incur them a huge reward, basically saying now it's a very important step, your gripper is in touch of the object, and then you should now try really hard to get this, uh, to get this, get to this state, and afterwards you could actually gradually pick up the object as well. So this reward engineering, we, we, we call it back then, is really um, challenging and requires some sort of the expert. For example, in this case, we have the expert knowledge, like uh, you know, if the gripper is in touch of the in touch with the object, it's a really good thing. So we need to eventually give them a, a huge reward. And this type of thing is not uh, sometimes it's even for human. It's even hard for human to design such reward. So go condition R or the multi go R is another form of R. Basically, we condition on uh, we condition a policy on a desired goal without any reward modeling. Our whole purpose of this um, task is changed to how we can get to this desired goal. Like we can either describe this desired goal by text, um, which people are often in China right now. Or we can describe this desired goal by images or states representations, which people are doing, uh, I think, uh, um, before then. So this uh, pro by providing this desired goal, the RL policy would be learned to reach this desired goal as soon as possible. So after it reaches this desired goal, the task is basically considered done. And uh, the major benefit of this one is uh, her only learns from very simple reward. We only design the reward, like the desired goal is achieved or not. So if the goal is achieved, we have a reward, for example, of one. And if not achieved, we have a, a zero reward. And uh, one of the major benefits from uh, deploying these types of algorithms to our real world scenarios is that uh, it not only learns from success cases but also from failure cases so we'll see how it uh, learns from failure cases uh, in the in the next slides so it actually used a very simple but elegant idea called the hindsight experience replay this is a very natural idea in uh, previous some of the robotic tasks which basically says if you have a success trajectory, basically you give the policy a desired goal and the policy's action actually leads to this desired goal in the specific trajectory. So then if you get this success trajectory, you could just do imitation learning or do supervised learning. Um, and then this, uh, like everything's fine. But if you have a, if you have a failed trajectory, like, uh, for example, if I want the overarm to actually grasp uh, a cup, 
but they actually grasp the apple uh, at the very end. Then this interesting thing happens. So what we could do is like uh, we relabel the goals, right? Based on this uh, achieved trajectory, achieved the state by the gripper. So let's say if we have the original, original goal is to grab grasp a cup on the table, and then we end up grasping um, apple. We could just relabel the goal as grasping an apple, and then we are creating a, one of the synthetic trajectories. That the goals and the, the the trajectories are aligned. So although this trajectory is considered failure in the original uh, scenario, but we could also use this relabeling experience to making this trajectory uh, a success trajectory, and then we could use utilize this type of failure data to train the to train our policy as well, because it reaches actually reaches reaches a different goal. So this is an entire algorithm. I'm going to uh, skip this uh, slide a little bit, but this algorithm basically is also in the her paper. Uh, it basically tells you how you can exactly doing this step by step and doing the experience, uh, hindsight experience uh, relabeling, re replay part. So now I think uh, we I, we want to introduce this part is uh, called our paper called the hindsight instruction relabeling. And we can see how it may be naturally fit to this goal condition or setting. This in this setting, we have these uh, instructions, and then we want the language model to actually output some of the useful sentence to actually align with the instructions or solving our specific problems. I will introduce a little bit of the notation here since this is a key concept part right, uh, to our your paper, but it might be a little bit different from people are commonly used today. So in this uh, online sampling part, which is basically we sample the access algorithm on this uh, using the language models, we have this kind of instructions, which we usually, which in our case, we consider as the task description or any of the menu instructions you want the, you want the, the language model to follow. On the on the on the specific task, and then you have the queries, which is uh, I think in our case, if your data set is a real question you want uh, the language model to solve. So, for example, in if we want to do the sentiment analysis um, task, this uh, instruction could be doing the sentiment classification task and uh, get the answer correctly, and uh, the query could be an actual sentence you want the language model to do the sentiment analysis or sentiment uh, classification. And then you ask the language model to generate the outputs together in this, uh, in, this, in this scenario. So after introducing these notations, uh, the, our, our algorithm actually runs a very simple uh, two-stage algorithm, which is uh, we alternate between this online sampling stage and offline training stage. So we pretty much basically online sampling a bunch of the experience and then feeding them to the replay buffer. And then we do a couple of rounds of training and uh, we use this new model to do sampling as well. And then we are repeatedly between this online sampling and offline training space. And uh, the major um, benefit or the major goal for this type of algorithm is that uh, we do want to actually avoid this RL training objective and uh, as you can see in our objective, in our offline training part, we only do very simple supervised fine tuning. Sorry, is there a question here? Yes, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to this part on how we can relabel this part. Um, I do think this is a good question. And in our paper, we did, uh, I, I would say proof of concept for this type of the relabeling part. I think I do think there are a couple of other ways where there's definitely better ways to do this, but uh, I'll I'll get back to this later. I think. So yeah, so this uh, major contribution of the, or the major advantage for our algorithm is like, like uh, we want to develop this very simple online sampling, offline fine tuning framework for this uh, 
alignment uh, purpose. And then this purpose will be, this algorithm would hopefully very, uh, very scalable, very simple, and uh, you know, avoids a, a lot of the RL, uh, the RL like hyperparameter tuning, RL hyperparameter sensitivity, or different uh, um, instability runnings between different seeds, so on and so forth. I think uh, this is our main goal for this project. And uh, now I can get back to how we can do the relabeling part of this uh, HAR, which is uh, this hang side instruction labeling here. So in our case, we do the we did this relabeling by running a bash script checking. So we do conduct our experiment in the big bench series of the of the experiments, and then. For this, we have the label the data set. We know actually what's the golden answer uh, to this question. And afterwards, we could do a very simple relabeling, like uh, give me the question, give me the answer of this question wrongly, or give me the answer of this question uh, correctly. This is very simple, one very simple relabeling part we are we're doing. And then we're basically just checking outputs with respect to the label. But uh, again, I think this is uh, one of the very interesting parts. So I want to spend a little bit more time here. I do think uh, we could get more um, informative relabeling part. For example, if we're solving a, or if we're solving a mathematical reasoning tasks, or if you're following the chain of thought format, like uh, the previous one we're seeing. Sorry, like the previous one we're seeing. Uh, I'll just here, for example, the red one. The red cafeteria has 23 apple example. So what we could also extract from this type of response is like, uh, uh, for example, they're actually solving this task in four steps. This is something you could write in your instructions, like solving a task in four steps. The first step would be corresponding to, um, you know, the, the functionality of uh, describing how many, how what's the objective, what describing the objective of the, of the current status, like the cafeteria has 23 apples. A second one is uh, you have 23, uh, they use 24 lunch, so they had the uh, 23 minus 20 equal to three. And uh, this is like the second step. And the third step is they bought six more apples. So have uh, three plus six equals nine. So if you have this uh, longer format of the, longer format of the response, you could actually construct more informative Relabelings, basically, like we can see, solving the question in three steps. The first step involves uh, what functionality. The second step is involves what functionality, and then you could also provide a short description on how what's the current uh, situation of uh, each solving steps. So I want to I do want to highlight a little bit here, is because if we are considering this longer format of the of the outputs. We could actually construct more, I think, uh, informative feedbacks comparing to zero or one scores ranking by the human beings. And then you could provide this kind of the um, prompts as relabeling part to the natural language models. Uh, one limitation here we're having is why we need we only use the right or wrong answers as our instructions is that uh, we're. Our our model is based on the flat T five series of the of the models, and I found actually in this type of the models the context lens is only five hundred and twelve, so it's really hard for these types of models to generate a reasonable or consistent uh, uh, longer format of the generative tasks. And often, like after the instruction, after the uh, question description, the token lens is already several hundred. So there's not only too much for you if you want to actually add some of the chain of thought uh, exemplars. Uh, this will be already out of the contact lens of the model capacity. So I do think if we have longer token, longer context lens for the base model, we could actually try something very more, much more, much much more interesting than what we're trying to do right now. But uh, as uh, as the uh, RL or the uh, academic people, this paper I do think is a really proof of concept paper showing we can utilize this algorithm to do the things of, to do the exact functionality of the RLHF without actually the RL training objective. And I do think there's a lot of opportunities afterwards 
uh, either on how you can do this readability, is that automatic, uh, or how you can avoid this bash script, and uh, how you can provide uh, this relabeling part given the longer sequence of the generated outputs. I do think these are really, really interesting questions, and some of them were actually actively studying them right now. So one of the, except for this uh, online sampling and offline training pipeline, supervised learning pipeline, well, only one of the um, loss we are adding to the offline training is this uh, contrast loss. Basically saying the same output doesn't get aligned to different instructions and prompts. So what we, if, if we were found in our experiment is like uh, it only if we don't have this type of the contrast loss, we would often get up like uh, ending up getting the same answers, which, you know, aligns to both the instruction, like give me the correct answer or give me the right, the wrong answer. So even if you're providing these two type different of the instructions or prompts, the model would generate the same outputs. And this is uh, something we are trying to avoid by introducing this additional contrastive loss. So again, this pipeline is only involves about uh, uh, online sampling part and offline supervised learning with a little bit additional to this contrast learning loss. And uh, that's basically it. We'll see how it uh, performs actually afterwards comparing. So here is a little bit of summarization of the of the um, three different algorithms. The first one is the PPO algorithm. The second one is final answer R algorithm. This is published by the DeepMind in the last year. They studied the outcome supervised and the process supervised the learning for the for the mass solving task for the GSM 8K task. And third one is ours. Basically, we can see that uh, both the fin final answer RL and our paper do not have any additional hyperparameters. Uh, and uh, they are both utilize the supervised learning unlike the PPO algorithm. And there's no actually additional care penalty introduced in um, both our, our algorithm and the final answer RL algorithm. But one thing different from this final answer algorithm and comparing to ours is that this final R algorithm um, works as you sample a bunch of experience and then you filter out only the correct, you filter out the incorrect responses. You only keep the correct alignment scores and then you do imitation learning. This is what they call the final answer RL. So in this case, you don't utilize any of the failure cases. This would mean like if your model is originally very bad at solving these type of the tasks, then um, maybe one of the one of one hundred uh, outputs, or even like one out of a thousand outputs, will be the correct answer. And it, it's really hard to get this working because it cannot learn from the failure cases. So actually, thing is, I want to briefly introduce uh, some of the experiments we did on our objective. We we'll see that we use this uh, flan T five large series of the of the objectives of the or original uh, models. Uh, this is a fine tuning, which we think like the so fine tuning is not um, baseline we're comparing to, but rather than uh, upper bound of the uh, performance. This is only because uh, the fine tuning would uh, require you to actually know the labels, where the RL tuning or this PPO FAR and the HIR algorithm, the only requires you the model to give sort some of the feedback. They don't require you to actually know what's the correct answer or not. So we do think like this fine tuning is uh, it's the upper bound or it's the reference number we're uh, just adding to the table here. We just want to see basically by telling you exactly what will be the correct outputs, what performance the model can get afterwards. So we can see that uh, um, in some of these uh, tracking shelf object tasks, uh, we can get pretty much improvement, like uh, let's say from uh, five tra tra tracking shelf objects, the no training is like 15% each of the performance. We, after training, we can get 60%. Uh, and uh, we can have 40% uh, for this tracking shuffle object seven, which is like uh, the shuffle seven objects. And also this happens for logical detection. 
we have like a 50% improvement for three objects and then 20% improvements. But for this logical detection of several objects, I do, we do think, we do observe that this fine tuning baseline is uh, much, is a little bit better than what we're having right now. And uh, I think some, what's noting that some of these tasks is, uh, is like the multiple choice task, like uh, for example, this track and shuffle objects and this logical detection. So the way they work is, this still is a generative task, but they would put all of the options or the, all of the choices in their prompts. And they ask the, mod they ask the model to generate uh, which of the options they will take. The model could uh, is definitely free to generate uh, anything else, but uh, by giving this uh, multiple choices in our prompts as an options, the model is very, very strongly biased to generating those. So we will view this as a multiple choice task. But uh, still one thing uh, worth to note is that uh, this word sorting task is a purely generative task. We do, we do not provide any of the choices here. So we can see that actually in this type of task, there's a still a very strong, very large gap between the audio tuning method and the fine tuning method. But this is also understandable because uh, in this type of setting, if you take, if you know, even if you know the output is wrong, it's not aligned with the instructions, you still don't quite know what uh, might be the good answer is. So I think this, ta this type of task, we do actually have a more information gain, much more information gain if we are doing fine tuning. Basically, we're providing the golden choose or the labels of the data set. But uh, here, yeah, here is uh, one example here. And uh, for this uh, PPO algorithm, we, for this PPO algorithm also baselines, we actually use uh, the corpus uh, code base and we actually heavily tuned some of the hyperparameters like care penalty uh, constraint, like the learning rate, like I think a couple more hyperparameters. And uh, the reporting results here is al already the, the best ones we could get out of these hyperparameters. But sometimes you can see that for logical deduction, uh, it's like relatively can get comparable performance for, uh, uh, sorry, not comparable, but it get, get uh, Oh, sorry, this is a bad example. But for data understanding, it can get kind of comparable performance. And uh, for this uh, object counting, it's not quite so good because it's only improving 2%. So I do think uh, like uh, there's potential we didn't quite actually tune this uh, algorithm that enough because because of the deadlines. And also there's potential uh, some yeah, there's potential like maybe PPO algorithm is not uh, super uh, suitable for this uh, T5 series of models like this uh, uh, sequence, sequence or encoded decoder structure. And uh, we do also admit that. So this baseline could be improved, but we do want to show one thing here is like uh, this type of algorithms is really sensitive to the task, to the model structure, and also to the hyperparameters we are using. So this is again, show some of the proof of the evidence that uh, the traditional PPO algorithm or the traditional R algorithm could be a little bit hard to get it working. And uh, we do have some need, we, or we do have some benefit to introducing a more stable algorithm by uh, either this uh, final answer RL or this our HIR algorithm here. So um, I think this is be the, the last slides I want to present here is uh, to show basically how the um, how this can uh, generalize across different models. So here we just uh, select uh, six tasks, uh, and then we're providing. Sorry, this is not six tasks, but uh, this is actually twelve tasks. But we have been uh, missing some of the task uh, titles in the second uh, second row here. So. Uh, this, but we sh want to show that this task actually, this figure actually shows we cannot, we not only do well on the on the uh, large base of the uh, of the models, but we also have the results improvement on the FLAM base model as well. So this just uh, an ablation study on whether we can 
if we have a smaller model, will we have a larger model? Like we're also working on currently on the T5 uh, XXL models. So this basically we want to study if we have a larger or a smaller model, how much the performance could be improving. And we do think we do see that uh, in this data understanding of the object counting, we do see larger improvements here, like also this raising colored objects. But for this word sorting task is really interestingly after our uh, pipeline, the results is actually getting a little bit worse. So which means like uh, maybe the model itself don't have enough capacity to actually successfully learn from this uh, this type of task because this word sorting task is really complex. You have to actually compare character by character on different words and uh, making them a good uh, ordering afterwards. So this is, I, I think, a good, actually complex task. And this might be indicating that, uh, uh, you know, if we our base model don't have enough capacity, and then this further massive instruction fine tuning or this uh, further, um, I think, hindsight instruction labeling could actually incur some of the like negative penalty, negative uh, performance results on this type of tasks. Yeah, so I think that's uh, this would be my uh, last slide. And uh, uh, thanks everyone for listening. I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Or does the audience have any questions? Um, so maybe while people are thinking about what they want to ask, I have my own question. So yeah, sure. I don't know. Can you go back to the slide? Sorry, I know you just uh, unshared, but if you don't mind sharing again, and then going back to the slide where um, you were talking about computing uh, like some similarity score, you have this contrastive loss. Yes, this one. Yeah, so I'm trying to understand. I guess I, I, I was not familiar with hindsight relabeling before this, and I guess the idea is you for like a particular trajectory, you want to find the goal which is solved by that particular trajectory, right? Yes, yes. So in, in this context, if you have like a response from the model, you want to generate the prompt which elucidates that specific response. Yes, yeah. Um, and so I guess this is easier in the context of, so I, I, I don't quite understand how you generate this, like how, how you find this prompt. So like, I guess you have two potential prompts here, like QK and PK, right? So can you talk, can you like go into more detail about how you find like the correct prompt for like a given response? Yes, so um, I think uh, if we, yeah, so sorry. I think um, uh, one thing we did like also admit this is a very uh, proof concept or this part we didn't actually solve very perfectly. I do think there's a lot of uh, room of improvement, but I, we what we do is like uh, we have the labeled data set we have for example this uh, logical deduction task we have this labeled data set like uh, the question description and also the final golden answer we're having okay so, so like the, the, the yeah. problem is like um you have uh, a red box and a blue box and now i want you to choose the box which like is I, I'm not sure. But yeah, so you have some statements and then some yeah. like ground truth, like A or B or something like this. Yes. So we have the statements like uh, we have the maybe the blue box in the left, the red box in the middle, and the yellow box in, on the right. And then we start shuffling these objects. And what's the final? Um, I think what's the final uh, position of these objects? And then we ask the model directly to generate. And then we know the golden answer to this shuffled. Uh, like uh, the object ordering sh after the shuffling. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, do a bash script checking the model outputs between the model outputs and also the golden answer. Like for example, um, you get the positions of the red box correctly. You get the position of the wrong, uh, blue box correctly, or you get the position of the maybe yellow box wrongly. So oh, I see. So you, you have to, do you have to like, so in, in this example, you actually have to compute like, which box ends up in each location. And then this determines like what the correct prompt would, would have been. 
Yes, yes. But this, oh, uh, okay. yeah, this is output generated by the language model, and we do do some of the checking between the outputs and also the labels. Yes, yeah. but, okay. but this this is uh, what we also want to talk a little bit more here because I feel like this is quite also important. Uh, this is what we did right now because we don't have a reward model. I think uh, another possible way, uh, although I haven't personally tried, and I would like to admit that, but uh, I think another possible way, which if we have a reward model, if we have a human preference model, we could basically relabeling like uh, this, um, you know, this experience like uh, give me a 70% uh, human preference outputs or give me a 80% human preference outputs. We could directly just use this uh, feedback from the reward model instead of doing the, instead of requiring to check the outputs and the labels or, or the golden truth labels, we could directly utilize the outputs from the reward models to actually uh, relabel this stuff. That's yeah. what I think would be also possible to do. I see. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a. Uh... Yes. So I think uh, someone asked you a question about. Uh, uh, the relabeling method is that uh, uh, I think uh, clear. I think I just explained this. But uh, one thing I would want to actually notice, like um, these tasks are all um, single task fine tuning. We didn't do multitask fine tuning, which I think would be also interesting to do this because uh, this would be requiring us to actually combining all the tasks together. Uh, so because we didn't, we only do single task and in this, in this experiments, and we only show the generalization within the task. So we don't have any results on task generalization on that level of task generalization. But uh, I think that would be also a very good concept or a very good uh, experience to learn. But I think if we want to show some of the task level generalization, we might need to actually massively running the different tasks like uh, what uh, the flam v2 paper is did paper did is like 1.8 uh, thousand tasks we might need some of that level of the task in order to achieve some of the generalization so that's something i was i think uh, it's a little bit hard for me at least to do because uh, because of just because of a compute but i think if uh, it is if there's a chance in the future i would like to also explore that as well Gotcha, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, hello, okay. can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, first, thanks a lot for the talk. It was really great. Um, and so I had a couple of questions, but you actually answered most of them in your last answer. And so my last question is, um, if you have, um, um, human preference model, a reward model, um, instead of uh, writing in plain text the objective you want for the reward, uh, could you, couldn't you use instead a trajectory in the, in the token space uh, of the model and just scale this, uh, this direction um, with the reward you, you have um, maybe sort of like they did in the decision console paper. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, I um, I think uh, if I understand correctly, like you're you're basically uh, thinking if we have a reward model, we could do exactly the decision transformer type of the of the algorithms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a part I was also discussing with Alex previously. It's like uh, if we have a reward model, we could do this uh, relabeling of the reward model as well. But I think uh, I do agree. It's uh, it's also possible, or it's also pretty good idea to actually do the decision transformer like of the of type of the algorithm. One thing is like uh, in their algorithm, it's actually formulated as a, as an offline RL. So it basically only involves this uh, offline training part. You don't have the online sampling part. It, I, I think at least in their, it's in their original paper. And I know a couple of also other follow-ups trying to actually uh, generalize this, like in contest the, the algorithm distillation paper, also trying to 
do the similar type of this. This is uh, one thing I think uh, it doesn't, yeah, I, I think the short answer is it doesn't prevent us from using the distribution of transformer like algorithm. And uh, the second one is uh, I do personally think um, expressing the transformers or just providing this scores doesn't actually provide you very much of the information. I do really like the idea of transforming this uh, reward score into some of the text. Basically, like we're representing everything text, we're also representing this return or rewarding text. And then this could give us a unified framework. Instead of like, uh, if you just plainly use the decision transformer, you might say like, uh, give me a trajectory, a score of, uh, in, uh, like basically you might just say, here is, uh, this will be just a plainly uh, a float number, like 100. And then you're asking a question. Or well, this will be just the uh, flow number of uh, 95.8. And then you're asking a question. And do you think uh, maybe you are actually providing a more detailed uh, instructions, transferring this score basically into the natural language space could be more um, intriguing. But I, I guess that's also my personal opinion here. Yeah, I, I agree that like just giving a flat number uh, doesn't uh, sound um, like a good idea. Um, but uh, I saw someone who, who was trying to, to do something like you choose a, a direction in the, in the space of, the, of, uh, of world, so after the building matrix, and you, you also train this direction, and uh, then you provide this as a token and you scale it uh, depending on the reward. And uh, I was wondering if you think that is promising or, or not. I see. You mean directions is like uh, something like maybe guided exploration? Uh, like um, you could just say like this token, for example, you, you, you take the direction in the space of the token hashtag and then you scale it with uh, the reward. And so instead of having the direction of the token hashtag, you, you just train the direction somehow. Oh, I see, I see. You, you mean may, maybe in the, if I get this correctly, like uh, we could specify some of the directions using the tokens and then ask the language model to just uh, run along this direction or explore on this direction. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I do think that's a pretty uh, neat idea. And actually that uh, corresponds to the original like uh, uh, her paper which they use the uh, go as a desired state, basically just a state in the trajectory. I do think one of the potential thing would make this a little bit weird here is like, uh, um, after, then it, it basically you provide the, some of the tokens in the outputs and then in your instructions, which I think uh, we probably, I don't know, shouldn't be um, restricting your, your outputs somehow, I guess. But uh, I, I do think that could have the potential of uh, improving the exploration or improving the final performance of the algorithm. That's also one thing I would uh, want to, uh, I, would, I would think uh, this, uh, our inside instruction reliability is different from the previous one. It's because in the previous one, you could directly take the final, maybe the token as your state representation, uh, sorry, as your, your, as your goal, and then you would relabel your experience trajectory like this. But here, I do think this uh, is a little bit weird taking the token of your end token of your last trajectory to representing as your instructions. Um, but maybe I think that's, maybe some people are thinking this may be fine. Yeah, I don't have a very strong opinion on this. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, all right, I think we're a bit over time. So unless there is like one more quick question, or is there one more quick question? Okay, uh, let's thank Dian Hoon one more time uh, for the great presentation. And um, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks Alex for inviting. Of course, happy to have you. Yeah. All right, so everyone have a good day. Yeah, see you. Bye.